Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It is a new year filled with new grace from our good God. We're expectant that he's going to do so very much, including through his word this morning. It's our custom each year, or been our custom as Bethlehem and this year as South Cities to begin the year by focusing on a sermon centered around the word of God, follow up with a sermon about prayer in response to the word of God. And we're gonna continue the pattern that we've had in other years. We're gonna have two sermons subsequently to that on the 15th and the 22nd focused on the image of God in humanity and what the word says about that. And then on January 29th, we're gonna have a very unusual service where we gather to celebrate and eat food and read a covenant to one another and formally in that way commit ourselves to our life together in Christ. So I'm looking forward to what January is bringing. Quickly, to begin our time, context of the book of James. James is not the disciple of Jesus during his lifetime, one of the apostles that was killed by King Herod in the book of Acts. James is Jesus' earthly brother, who, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 7, did not believe, apparently, in Jesus while he was alive. In fact, there's several texts that point out, like, Jesus' family thought he was kind of crazy during his earthly ministry. But James had this unique position in that after Jesus rose from the dead, he appeared to his brother. And apparently that had something to do with James's conversion. James subsequently became a leader in the church at Jerusalem, and his name is found throughout the book of Acts, involved in major decisions. Likely later in his life, 20 or more years after Jesus' death and resurrection, James wrote this epistle, this letter, to churches scattered around the Roman world. It's often thought of as kind of like wisdom literature, like a Proverbs of the New Testament. When we preached through the book of James in 2017, maybe you were around for that, we were at this thing called a high school over that way, kind of a, uh, that was the season when we were actually meeting in the gym because they were doing renovations in the place that we normally met. Myself, uh, Pastor Chuck Stedham, Chris Bruno, some others, preached through James in seven messages, and what we said, the theme, the core theme of James is, is living an undivided life before God in comparison to living a divided life, and especially how God and his word helps us live a consistent and faithful life. And what we're going to do in these verses is talk very much about that. My prayer today is you would see in the word your need for the word in 2023, that this is the most precious of gifts that God has granted us. And so that if you're seeking to live a whole life before the Lord undivided, that you'd be encouraged in that. And if you come this morning and your heart is divided, some in love with God, some in love with the world, that God would use this message to unite your heart. And if you're here this morning and you're not really interested, or you're ambivalent, or somebody else brought you here, or you're visiting. First, we are so glad you're here. It's my prayer that this morning, God, by his word, would convict you, change you, bring you to himself for your joy. Would you pray with me? So God, this morning, unite my heart. My brain feels foggy and scattered after New Year's celebrations. God, help us to submit to your word together as a people for our joy. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So I'm going to back up just a little bit from where Sam started. So if you have a Bible, I hope you're in James chapter 1, verse 16. What does James say about the word of God? What does it do? What does God use his word to do? First, God uses his word to create a people. This is verse 16 through 18. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. 
Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So first, we see that James doesn't want his readers, his hearers, this is likely said out loud in local church contexts, he doesn't want his hearers to be deceived. We see that directly in verse 16 and again in verse 22. And then there's an implied, don't be deceived in verse 19. The admonition not to be deceived also shows up in chapter five, verse 19, translated as wander. The idea of wandering away from the truth. If somebody wanders away from the truth, go after them. James readers were tempted to stop believing certain truths about God and his word and he wants to call them back. And I want you to note the repeated refrain in this section, beloved brothers. He keeps calling them beloved brothers. The earthly brother of our Lord Jesus calls all these people who he hasn't met beloved brothers. They're loved as a family. So James' encouragement for his readers, I think echoing the very heart of God, is not the kind of disinterested encouragement of a a boss or a professor who maybe is just like overwhelmed with the amount of people he's got to, you know, teach. It's the involved love of a brother or a father. Years and years ago when I was uh, a manager at a Chick-fil-A and I was given an opportunity to make a career change, I remember my boss and I having this conversation uh, as I was closing up the Chick-fil-A one night. He's like, I mean, you're not going to be able to do both things. You'll need to quit. It'll be fine. Do what you want. And I went home and talked to my dad about the opportunity. He said, don't be an idiot. Stay at Chick-fil-A. Why did he do that? Because he saw and he was looking ahead and he was involved in the outcome of my life. He loved me in a way that my boss did not. This is not a disinterested kind of love that God shows for us, but an intense familial love. So first, he doesn't want them to be believed. Uh, He doesn't want them to be deceived. And he says that in verse 17, that God's character reveals something about his new creation. What does he not want them to be deceived about? Particularly that the character of God and the kind of gifts that he gives are not like shifty. God's not a shifty God, a stingy God. God is single-hearted and single-minded all the time, immovable, fixed and not in a way that's dispassionate. I mean, God is without passions in one sense, but in another sense, he's very much with passions, passionate about his glory, and his glory shown through his love to his creation. You could say it this way, God is not double-minded. He's not divided in any way. He's holistic in his love. You'd say that when we pray the Lord's Prayer, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying, there's nothing divided in heaven. Make it that way here on earth. Make it so that our hearts are united. Father of lights here in verse 17 is probably there to remind the readers of God's creative work in Genesis 1. He's the one that put the lights in the heavens, the stars, the moon, the sun. His original creation shows the kind of God he is. He created out of nothing by his voice. No variation or shadow due to change. The paragraph just before this, James has said that God doesn't have evil in him, that he might tempt anyone. He's all good all the time. And the gifts that he gives, like his word, holy good, without error, without fault. So then third there under that first point, What kind of gift is James particularly interested in in this context, talking about, having his hearers hear about? That God's word is his means for a new creation. Notice one connection. Look at, if you've got your Bible, look at verse 18 and look at verse 25. So this adjective, perfect. God gives perfect gifts, and then he repeats that word in verse 25 about a perfect law. Now, we did it, and we were just reading it in Psalm 119. David is so interested in God's word, God's commandment, God's law. These are often uh, aligned as parallel words. 
What does this word do that James puts out, this perfect gift that's granted? It brings us forth. Brings us forth is the same word in Greek translated in verse 15 as gives birth in the context about uh, giving birth to sin. It's It's a pregnancy and birth metaphor. You heard any other language in the Bible about birth, spiritual birth? You must be born again in the Gospel of John. This is language of conversion that even points back to the Old Testament. Jeremiah 31, I'm going to put my law in their hearts. Ezekiel 36, I will make their hearts flesh and give them the new birth, this new covenant. This is what James, James is pointing out, what the Bible has pointed out all along, that what's happening in the coming of Jesus, the proclamation of the gospel, is a new creation. There's a new creation that's here. The language of first fruits picks up the Old Testament language about a sacrificial system where the Israelites would bring the best of their crop to God. And the New Testament picks up that language. I'm just going to briefly mention this for time's sake, but in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 26, one of the things that is said is that Christ has been raised from the dead. This is 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. If, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection from the dead. For as an Adam all die, so also those in Christ, for it says in Christ, shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ, the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. It's language of there's a, a kind of new creation being ushered in, or Colossians 1 also has similar language. Colossians 1 verse 15, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. So in what way is Christ the firstborn, this kind of initial thing of of a new creation? First, it's really clear in his resurrection. Other people had been raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. A few people in the Old Testament, people in Acts, they all died. Every single one of them died, eventually. Christ never died again, and he won't die again. And when you, if the Lord tarries, pass away, you will raise again to new life if you're in him, never to die again. That's what it means to be part of this new creation. No longer maladies, no longer hospitals, no longer doctor checkups, no, long, no longer uh, long, sad nights, grief, but healed forever. No pain, no sorrow. This is what it means to be firstborn, to be part of the first fruits. But also I think it's true that Jesus in his incarnation, we just finished the Christmas season, Jesus in his incarnation is also a picture of this first or this new creation. When the Spirit of God moved in Mary's womb and divinity clinged to humanity in a unique way in all of history, we see that Emmanuel, God, is with us. This is what it means to be part of God's new creation where God is with his people in his world perfectly. If God by his voice speaks at the first and everything is created out of nothing in Genesis 1, so too he speaks and something's created out of nothing in the womb of Mary, so too he speaks and those that are spiritually dead don't just wake up but start breathing spiritually. This is what it means to be part of the new creation. By being in Christ, by believing the gospel, we are born again into this new creation. It all happens by the word, the speaking of the word. If we were connected to Adam by our unbelief, when we are disconnected from Adam and connected to Christ, we are the first stroke of the clock of a new era. We rang in the new year last night. I didn't. I slept until somebody set off a firework and then all my kids woke up and thank you, uh, fireworks companies. 
That first stroke of the clock after midnight was the start of a new year. Christ's resurrection is the first stroke of the clock of a new era, the new heavens and new earth coming to earth. And every time someone believes, it's that. It's that beginning of new creation. So the bells ring on Christmas Day to to herald the coming of a king, and they keep ringing. They keep ringing. This is the way that Romans 8 talks about the new creation, when we're told that the creation is longing for the children of God to be revealed in their glory because the children of God are going to be the first part, and not going to be, but already are, in a sense, that first wave of a new creation present with us. Just like in Genesis 1, God's Spirit hovers over the darkness and He speaks and creation is made, so too here God's Spirit hovers over darkness of unbelief and where He speaks new life is made. So if you're here this morning and you're not sure if you're in Christ, just like not sure that I've been born again in the way that you're talking about, Daniel, again, we are so, so glad you're here. I've been praying this week that this morning might be the morning where you, if you're a kid and you've been coming and you've been hearing all of this for a long time, if you're a visitor and you're not sure where you stand before Jesus, that this very moment the Spirit of God would flood into your heart and change you. He can do that. That's what the text says. Do we believe him? If you're wondering just, well, what is this gospel? Well, just real quick, it's the best news in the world. You've heard me talk about it, but I'll just summarize it here for you. Jesus lived a perfect life that we could not live so that he could stand in our place before God, and then he died a death that we deserved so that his sacrifice would be sufficient to pay the penalty for our sins, but then he didn't stay dead. He rose. He got up, never to die again. And right now, he's a king reigning in heaven. He's going to come back to earth, and all those that are in him will reign with him. And those that are not in him, judgment awaits. We long for you to face your creator clothed in the right standing of Jesus that he offers you in this gospel. If you're like, I'm not sure what this means, I'd like to hear more, I want to talk to you. I want to spend time with you. I've got a study in the Gospel of Mark that I would love to go through with you. Or if you're like, man, I'm here with somebody else and I want to do that with them, come talk to me. I'll buy you a copy of that that, uh, study and you can do it with them. So we're created by the Word. But then do we leave the Word behind? Is that just kind of an initial thing? Is that initial moment of excitement at the new birth give give way to another kind of living? No. We're created by the Word to hear the word. It's the second point, verses 19 through 21. We're created to be hearers of the word. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So first there in verse 19, he begins... Uh, Similarly to verse 16, but with kind of a positive admonition, know this, my beloved brothers. There's an implied possibility of deception here, and I think it's important to stop and just note this, all right? James is organizing this around specific dangers that he sees in in the churches that he's writing this letter to, and he wants to confront those. So here he sees that there's the possibility of anger, which he sees as inconsistent with hearing God's word. And what he does is he urges his readers to return to God's word. I think about this when, um, you know, 2020, 2021, 2022, um, so many things were going on with the pandemic and with things happening in the broader body of Bethlehem and other things along those lines. And I kept asking myself, I journal extensively. I like, I'm constantly journaling for the last two decades. I was asking myself repeatedly, what's the next thing that's gonna show up? How can I be better prepared? How can I as a pastor, as a Christian, as a husband, as a dad, 
Be ready for what's coming next. And over and over again, I kept returning back to this reality. I can't. I actually can't. I, I don't have, you know, precognition, you know, premonition, pre-whatever to look into the future. What do I have? I have the very word of one who created time and space. And I can cling to him through that word and be better prepared for whatever tomorrow brings. So we can't be mainly focused on our culture around us, can't be mainly focused even on our family or even ourselves, actually. We must be oriented in our hearts towards God and his word. So James brings up in this second point a problem, man's anger. Verse 20, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, because the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So implied here is a deception. You can have the anger of man, and it will produce the righteousness of God. James saying, no, can't do that. When uh, I see something is out of order, or my kids are behaving a certain way, and I rise up in anger at them, I'm like, that's going to fix the situation. No, it won't. It doesn't produce the righteousness of God. No. That kind of anger will always go awry. Now, that's not to say that there's not a righteous and good kind of anger, God's anger, right? So I think there's passages like Ephesians 5 that talk about that to some degree. But that's not what James is talking about here. Now, I want you to note something. This is a big deal. If you're like, ooh, exegetical, like show me something interesting in God's word. I want you to look with me closely down at verse 20 and 21. There's a linchpin here or a pivot that I think a lot of people miss when they're going through the book of James. Because again, people kind of are like, James is like the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's kind of this loosely connected, different, you know, proverbial sayings. And there are some proverbial sayings. I think it's a bit more like there's a common theme or argument that James is putting forth. Verse, if in verses 16 through 18, we see that James's concern is to show that God's good gifts include his good word that creates new life in us, and in verse 21, God's word is upheld as the answer to our anger because of the therefore that's there, then we have to ask the question, well, then what is verses 19 through 20 about? Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, because the anger of man doesn't produce the righteousness of God. I think what is happening in verses 19 through 20 is this is not just kind of a generic proverbial statement like when you get into an argument, don't get angry. When you, uh, you know, when somebody's talking to you, like focus on them, be a good listener. I think what this verse is about is about our relationship to God's word. Let me make an argument for that. First, I mentioned the therefore in verse 21. So here's anger, right? Therefore, receive with meekness the implanted word. In many ways, meekness is the opposite of anger. So in context, what's being heard in verse 19, I think is also what's being heard in verse 22. So don't uh, be quick to hear what? The word whether it's on the lips of somebody else or coming to you directly. James is convinced that God's word that created us is what's necessary to sustain us, and therefore we receive it with meekness. I think particularly what he has in mind here is that we don't reject it in anger. It's the only way that I can make sense of, like, the previous three verses are about God's word, and basically the rest of the chapter is about God's word. And this one verse, just like pulling it out, like, proverbial statement, doesn't make much sense. Okay, even though I think it's true as a proverbial statement, be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, I think it's mainly oriented around God's word. Again, this is why he says, put away all wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. This is the solution. God's word comes and says, keep going, keep listening, and keep doing. Now, you might say, wait, aren't we already saved? 
back in verse 18, we've been brought forth by this word of truth or in the common way of talking, like, aren't we justified? Aren't we justified through faith in God and his word? Well, I'd say that what James is interested in here is the idea of justification, I have a right standing with God, of necessity continues in what we call sanctification or growing in godliness. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose from the dead, and right now reigns, he didn't just say justified, but he purchased the whole package. That's what Romans 8 is about. All those that are justified will surely be glorified, and what's in between justified and glorified? Sanctification. Jesus will surely do it, not ours to do. In fact, this adjective implanted shows how the word continues to work. The power of God's word gets put inside us by the new birth so that whereas it was external to us before, it moves to internal. And then we have to continue to receive this word in meekness throughout our lives. We must, but it is not our must. Like, you must play well on the drums today, Joe. Not like that, but like, man, Joe must play good on the drums today. Like, like the sort of thing that says like, there's an expectation that it will happen. Assuredly, now you're not as good at the drums as God is at sanctification, probably, but not, okay? That was not in my notes. So, but instead, like, like God must, this must happen as part of a process, right? So from beginning to end, God will certainly do this. It must happen. So, it's very much in line with Jesus' parable, the sower in Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. The word of God comes, it lands on different soils. What kind of soil are we? Are we the soil that bears fruit? So it's not as though God's word creates new life and the rest of the Christian life is spent away from the word. It's not like you practice your breathing for a marathon as you're getting ready to run, go, and then as soon as you start running, you hold your breath. What will you do if you hold your breath? Drop over, you know, you run out of air. No, we continue to breathe in, we continue to breathe out. I think that's what Pastor Dave says. Breathing in, God's word, breathing out in prayer. So James wants us to see in verses 16 through 18 that God and his word are perfect and incorruptible and his word gives birth to new life. And he wants us to see in verses 19 through 21 that God's word must continue to be received in meekness and not reacted against in anger if we're gonna grow in good works towards God and others. And for those who receive it in meekness, that kind of hearing produces fruit. We cannot be hearers only. So this is verses 22 through 25. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and he goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. James wants his readers to be clear that it isn't enough to just hear the word as though one can grow just by listening well, but the kind of hearer that receives the word in meekness will be the kind of hearer that heeds the word and does good. So, continuing on from hearing the word to doing what the word calls us to do, again, is not earning us a place before God. The faith alone that justifies us before God is what justifies us alone. But it doesn't stay alone. It produces fruit. So again, look at verse 22, the admonition. Don't be deceived about God or his word. Don't get duped. That only, that those that hear the word only are actually following God. It's the very essence of what James is concerned about throughout the letter. Those who only hear the word, don't seek to do it, aren't actually carrying the word with them in that implanted new birth kind of way. They're showing that the word wasn't implanted in them to begin with. So coming each week and hearing about the love of God, love for neighbor, won't actually do anything. Just hearing, listening, 
hearing, listening. God has granted us power, if we are in him, in Christ, to walk in obedience. Never perfectly, not earning a place before him, but it's through the word that by truly hearing it, we will truly heed it. So if you come here week after week, perhaps clinging to some sin, anger, bitterness, laziness, sexual sin, this word that you're hearing right now from God's word grants power when it's implanted in your heart to fight against that sin and move past it. Perhaps today is the day where you say, no more. No more. And for your joy, you turn to Christ so that tomorrow you can say no more. And in a month, you can say no more. And in a decade, you can say no more all the way home. To say, I won't be deceived any longer. I'll walk into the light. So here's the problem again. Verses 23 and 24 only hearing and thus forgetting. James illustrates this deception with an extended illustration, a mirror. What's it like when somebody hears but then doesn't go and do? They forget what they look like. They have short-term memory loss. Someone who bottles up all the knowledge and never acts on it is doomed to forget what they once knew. I think that's the point. It's almost common sense. If you're a teacher, you get this, right? Let me teach you. So take a uh, metaphor. Take math, everybody's favorite subject in school, right, kids? Let me show you how to do pre-algebra. Okay, all right, that's step one. All right, you show me how to do pre-algebra. That's step two. But when you actually see how pre-algebra helps you in the real world, it actually can help you, kids, all right? Like, it can, all right? that completes a circuit, a loop, and you say, oh, I, I, this was explained to me. I know how to talk about it, but then I'm actually using it. It strengthens what you learned in the first place. So too with God and his word. James is painting almost an absurd picture. It's someone who looks at a mirror, sees themselves, completely forgets what they look like whenever they're not looking in the mirror. Their memory isn't working correctly. They don't have something implanted in them. Kids, all the fighter verse nights, do you memorize all the stuff you learn in Sunday school, or frankly, just adults too? All the things you learn has to have an outlet. You will not retain what you've read and heard unless in the power of God, by his grace, only by his grace, you act to follow him and do what he's commanded, and he's promised you power for it. That's what verse 25 is about. Here's the solution. Doing, and you will remember. James's point, those who truly have the implanted word, remember it, take it with them, and it shapes them. Verse 25. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being not a hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he is the one who will be blessed in his doing. What is this perfect law, this law of liberty? I think there's a number of different ways that we could like talk about it, but I think most specifically, we get a big clue in Galatians chapter five. So if you have a Bible, turn with me back to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter five. So you might say, wait, there's a law that I must follow. There are other parts of the New Testament that talk about like being free from the law. Oh, here's this thing, law of liberty. Well, what's this? Galatians 5, 13 through 14, Paul, who's very interested in the book of Galatians about what the law is and how it relates to grace, says this. Galatians 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, You should love your neighbor as yourself. It's a law that brings freedom, love God, and love neighbor. We are granted freedom from the bondage of the law, the Old Testament law that did not grant life. We are granted a a law of liberty instead, love God, love others, that because of the power of the Holy Spirit 
we are able to pursue God through that. So when people say, God doesn't need you to do anything, sit back. Well, that's true. He doesn't need you to do anything. But he is a good father, has good desires for you to follow him. There's nothing that we can do to earn a place before him. That's true. Jesus has already earned that place for us. But we are called to walk in consistency with great salvation that we've been granted. And then note here, we won't go here too deeply, but the at very end of the chapter, verses 26 and 27, the word presses us towards the least of us here in this room and outside this room. True religion and undefiled is this, to visit widows and orphans in their affliction. True undivided religion looks like we look out for the least and we pursue them. So give online to the Helping Hand Fund. Please do. That's our, kind of our, our pot, our pool of money to help when there are people in need. But more than that, take the risk of just visiting someone. More than that, go up to someone that seems to be in need. Seek out those that are the neediest among us. So in conclusion, what does all this do? Again, we have to remember James is writing to churches, not separate individual Christians. Sometimes we can pick up our Bibles and just think, this is only for me by myself. But he wrote this to churches. He has instructions for elders in chapter five and for how people should relate to each other, like the poor and the rich in chapter two in the context of a gathering. So he envisions whole churches being persuaded that hearing the word and heeding the word will help them persevere in the faith. So I thought, where else in the Bible do we hear about local churches that are clinging to the word and finding through that that Jesus is holding on to them? And because I'm who I am, I thought the book of Revelation. So if you know anything about me, I'm always about that book of Revelation that we're hopefully going to preach through in a year or two. So brief word about the context of Revelation. You can turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. I'm just going to point out a couple things. Jesus, through the Spirit and through his servant John, writes seven real letters to seven real churches, condemning and commending them in what's modern-day Turkey, that they're going to face the initial stages of what are going to, what's going to be a widespread persecution of the church in the Roman Empire. One of those churches is the Church of Philadelphia, and it's one of two churches that is not condemned in any way or admonished, but just commended. And I want to point out a couple of things. Why are they commended? Because of the word of God and their relationship to it. Look at verse 8 of Revelation chapter 3. I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door that no one is able to shut. I know you have but little power, and yet you have kept my word and not denied my name. Verse 10, because you have kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on the earth. Here's a church about to suffer persecution, and they are clinging tightly to the word and so in doing clinging to one another. And they are finding that Christ is holding them in that. Because you have kept my word in the face of opposition and slander and accusation, that's what's going on in the first few chapters of Revelation. They're being lied about, and even some of them are being killed. Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you hold fast to me. And this is the word to us as a church, South Cities. Hold fast to Christ together, and in doing that, you're going to find he's holding fast to you. How will that happen in Philadelphia before great persecution arises in ancient Asia? How will that happen in Lakeville and the surrounding suburbs when we don't know what 2023 will bring? It'll happen because we cling to Christ by the word. He created us by the word. He calls us to hear him in it and to heed what it is he speaks. This is the way for us to follow him. I pray that we do so together in 2023. Would you bow your head and pray with me? So God, we're going to approach the word enacted 
the bread and the juice that points us to the word crucified for us, and we anticipate your coming again. So help us to heed your word as we prepare to take communion together. Help us in 2023 to be so focused on you through your word that we hold fast to you. And in so doing, remember that you're holding on to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.